Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, uh, first announcement, hopefully you know this by now, project two is due tomorrow. Um, so, you know, make sure you finish it. Um, oops, that was on the next slide. Uh, so, so you know, I've had a number of questions about what the final exam format is. Um, I still haven't decided because of all the problems we have with the SEC at the midterm. I'm like debating various options to try to make, you know, not that happen again. Uh, so as a result, I'm not ready to kind of say what it, the format's going to be. Um, we will do a review session because the content's going to be the same, right? Just the format, whether it's like Jupyter Notebook or written or a mix of both, or I was actually even toying with the idea of like a mini project that you would finish mostly during the exam period, but maybe you'd work on to start off before that. Uh, so I've been kind of toying with a bunch of different ideas. Uh, so, but unfortunately for all of you, it means I'm not quite sure of the format yet. Um, so sorry about that, but as uh, you know, could you raise your hand here if you uh, would prefer not to have the midterm experience again, right? Um, so I know I wouldn't. So that's why I'm I'm trying to think of uh, various ways that maybe we can alleviate that, as well as talking to the people who run SCC to make sure that's cool. So the question was if it'll be open web. Um, if the exam is digital, it will be open web. If there's a written portion, or like or the whole thing just goes written, it will not be. It'll be closed. Okay, so. Do I, I can tell you, I'll, you know, I will make a decision before the last day of lecture. Okay, so you will know before the review start, like during either during that or before that. Uh, so whatever that is, the eighth, it's like next Thursday. Um, you know, so you have plenty of time to prepare between then and the actual exam because the exam is pretty late. It's like the nineteenth or something. Um, so just you know, you will have time to prep even if it is closed. So if it does end up being written, um, I don't really like writing code on tests because like I, uh, you know, you see me, right? I make syntax errors all the time. Okay. If you do end up writing code, it will A, be not terribly carefully judged about syntax errors. Okay. There's an extra space somewhere, or, you know, it's a comma instead of a period or something like that. As long as it's a, it, you know, it looks reasonably like it's a typo or whatever, like I wouldn't worry about it. But even then, I'm much more likely to say, okay, you know, what's the method that goes here, right? Rather than, you know, kind of like you saw. I think I kind of did it in the midterm, like the, there was like a group example. It's like, you know, which function should I use here? It'll be more like that. So you might have to know group, but you won't necessarily need to know, like you won't have to write like an entire for loop or whatever. And the alternate exam will happen, right, on the 16th? Yeah. So the alternate exam, if you sign up for it, remember you have to sign up for it, okay? You have to tell me why you're signing up for it. Um, it's uh, it's on Piazza, the details, but it is the Friday before. Um, I remember no other details because once I write it down, it's out of my brain. Um, so go read it on Piazza. If you have any questions, obviously let us know on Piazza uh, and uh, we can answer them there. It will, uh, what I can say is that the format of the alternate will be the same as the final. Okay, so the format will be the same. Obviously the test will be at least slightly different. Okay, most, most notably, the way they all be different is kind of in the same way I try to do the midterms, which is that the crux of the question is the same, but if you are following somebody else's answers, you will get the answer wrong. Make sense? Okay, any other questions? All right, cool. All right, so moving on. Uh, just brief review, correlation coefficient, super important, okay? Um, you know, represented as R, it's the average of the product of X in standard units and Y in standard units. And so this is how you calculate it because you kind of read it backwards in English. Um, and it measures how clustered the scatter is around a straight line. Okay. Um, prediction. Okay. And so this is kind of sort of uh, like, you know, what you want to think about with prediction, right? Is that what we're trying to do is predict a Y value based on an X value. So if you remember when we were talking about the correlation, we can invert those. So you always want to predict Y values, 
difference. Okay, just it's it's a little bit more by norm and by easier math than because it has to be that way, right? You could manufacture a function that would kind of do it in reverse, but you always want to think about it in terms of you know trying to predict the y uh, in terms of the x. Okay, and so that when you're reading somebody else's one, for example, you you'll know that. It's usually a good idea to check anyway, but generally speaking, that will be the case. Okay. Uh, what else is here? So these are just kind of some examples. Um, we have uh, a bunch of stuff to cover today, so I'm not going to go through these too much. Um, but you know, as you can imagine, right, there seem like there'd be correlations between these things. If there's a lot of air pollution in a city, the number of hospital beds kind of actually should say like hospital beds available is going to actually does say is going to be reduced, right? Because you're going to have more people who are sick with a lot of air pollution, right? So therefore, they're going to use a lot more beds. So this was a particular concern during the pandemic where we didn't have enough beds for COVID people because of, you know, and vice versa, right? So we had an air pollution issue in a particular place that reduced the number of available beds for COVID patients uh, and invertedly, right? That's why they canceled all elective surgeries. They started canceling most non-elective surgeries, um, you know, where they could because they needed the hospital beds. So just kind of keep that in mind, there's relationships that don't necessarily seem obvious uh, to the, you know, just in general. Um, house prices using house size. That one's one of those ones that's super interesting because, you know, my house is actually quite small, relatively speaking, but it's in the middle of Boston, right? So as a result, it's, its value is actually quite a bit higher than a much bigger house if it's out, uh, you know, kind of in some rural part of Massachusetts, generally speaking. Um, and then, for example, predicting the number of app users and the number of app downloads. Um, we might talk about that more. I don't, or did we talk about that already in this class? Um, so, for example, if you look at uh, Google Play, for example, um, you know, Android users worldwide are a much higher number than uh, iPhone users. However, you often will see at least more paid app downloads in the iPhone universe because the structure is slightly different in that uh, Apple early on, um, I don't want to say convince their customers, but kind of the expectation was set amongst customers that apps were something you paid for. Whereas early on in the Android universe, apps were kind of set as something you didn't really pay for. So you can actually make a lot more money in the iPhone ecosystem if you build an iPhone app because people are more conditioned to pay for it even though the community of users is small by a significant percentage. So things like that is things you want to think about when you're kind of asking these kinds of questions. But, you know, we'll, you know, I think we're going to explore one of these a bit more, but I don't know if it's today or if it's next time. All right, so nearest neighbor regression. Um, I wanted to point something out, which may not have been totally clear, um, is that when we were talking about nearest neighbor originally, uh, when we were talking about the Galton Heights, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute, um, we were kind of talking about like we're looking at the nearest neighbors to make a prediction, okay? Which is subtly different from creating a line from those nearest neighbors, okay? So just kind of keep in mind that there is a distinction there. You're using nearest neighbors to build a line to do predictions is kind of one choice, or using kind of nearest neighbors directly. Obviously, if you can build a full line, you're going to be more successful, right? In the sense that you can predict values for a lot more options. So I don't know, for whatever reason, the data set you collected has nobody that's exactly, I don't know, let's say uh, seven, or, sorry, <laughs> that would be a lot, uh, five foot 11 to six foot one, for whatever reason, you can't make a prediction using just kind of a straight nearest neighbor model about somebody if you're using an inch as your delimiter, right? So as a result, it's better off if you can actually find a way to build a line through it, then you can still make a guess about that person who's exactly six foot, even though you don't have any nearest neighbors there. Does that make sense? Okay. So like I said, I wanted to kind of point it out because I wasn't sure if I made it clear that there is two different mechanisms there. Um, the distinction is 99% of the time, I think, lost over because almost no one uses a direct nearest neighbor model for real, okay? They always turn it into a line, okay? Or, or use some other mechanism um, because the nearest neighbor mechanism is kind of so gappy, right? 
So that's why it kind of tends to get glossed over. And then on top of that, there's a bunch of more sophisticated techniques using similar things to nearest neighbor that are a better choice in the vast majority of cases. And that's where you talk about cluster, for example, that we won't talk about in this course, but is kind of something to be aware of. If you actually go and Google nearest neighbor uh, algorithm or whatever, you can find nearly nothing. What you'll find is what's called KNN or K nearest neighbor, which is much more in the clustering space. Um, so if you're just Googling around to study for this class, just keep in mind that if you come across nearest neighbor, it's likely not the right one. Okay, we use a much simpler version of the same concept. Okay, cool, makes sense. Yes, anyone? Bueller? Anyone awake? Too much soccer? All right. Uh, I saw like 10 minutes of soccer today. Stupid meetings, I'll just say. Um, all right, so going back to lines. So as you may or may not recall, right, um, this is the expression or the formula that we use for a line, okay? Um, you'll often see, you know, these as like um, uh, kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like a variable name uh, that, uh, you know, is usually used in math, but we're actually going to call it slope and intercept both for ease of understanding, but also because we're going to make formula or not formulas, we're going to make functions that actually calculate those. So nine times out of 10, it's actually going to say slope because it's actually a function call. Okay, so we have this, right? So what we know, right, is that in our, what's referred to as training data, so in our real collected information, we have a whole bunch of X's and Y's, okay? But so how do we get to the slope and the intercept? And that's what we're gonna talk about now for a second. And that is, um, oh, I was supposed to hit this slide, then say that. Um, but so what we can actually do is we can use the mechanisms we've been talking about a lot lately to figure out what that slope and the intercept should be. Sorry, down here. So here's the calculation we do for slope. So we can take that R, which we know how to calculate, multiply it by the standard deviation of Y divided by the standard deviation of X, okay? And this is the arrays. Um, and that'll give us the slope, okay? And then we can also do the same thing with the intercept, except if you notice, right, it depends on the slope. So we have to do the slope first. Then we can calculate the intercept by doing this function, which is the average of y's minus the slope times the average of x, okay? And then, because now we have those two functions, we can actually get to an estimate of y for any given x. Make sense? Yeah? All right, and so just kind of by way of picture, right, um, this is kind of how we think about it normally, okay, in standard units, uh, or in original units, it's the standard deviation over there. So it's just kind of saying like, look, it's exactly the same line, right? And this I kind of been harping on a bit, it's that whether or not it crosses at zero or whether it's kind of shifted somehow, but the line is the same, you know, it's, it looks the same but the intercepts will be different in the sense that this, let's say the intercept here is, I don't know, two, okay? In terms of the line itself, it's the same as this one where the intercept is always zero, okay? But what we did was we shifted our data to be in the standard units so that we can wrap it around zero, right? So, but at the end of the day, the lines are, are the same. It's just that they're shifted in scale the same way the actual data units are. Okay, so I don't know why I harp on that a bit, but uh, you know, at least for me, that's one of the things I find confusing is that those are the same thing. Um, so I presume that other people do too. So that's why I talk about it. Um, if you get it, then maybe you get it and I'm just slow, which is certainly a possibility. All right, so now we're gonna do a little bit of a demo, but what we're gonna start with on the demo, oh, this is in um, the lecture, uh, the normal place for lectures. From this. Um, okay, and so uh, if you remember last time, we didn't get to uh, a little bit of stuff. Um, I almost cut it, but decided to keep it anyway. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a table that has an, you know, an R value of 0.99, right? So does anybody remember, let's, uh, I don't know, hold up your hands in the direction 
that a line that has an R looks like. All right, let's see. I'll reverse it in my head. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so up and to the right, okay? Um, and so it's just gonna generate us a random table that looks like that. We throw it on a scatter plot. It looks basically like that. Um, and then, I don't know why I did it again. Um, same idea. All right, but then we wanna be able to do our predictions, right? So what we need to do is calculate our predictions. And so this, remember, is using just the nearest neighbor model. Okay, so we're gonna say here, and hopefully you remember this, we've talked about this before. We're gonna look at the neighbors um, and we're gonna say example dot where x oops, <laughs> r dot between x val and wait, my friends are, uh, sorry, minus uh, 0.25. So this time we're doing it within a half inch. Um, and X val, sorry. Plus 0.25, right? And then we're gonna take the average of those neighbors. So we're gonna say NP mean, and we're gonna say neighbors dot column Y. And so this should give us a prediction, um, uh, except I have a bug. Oh, sorry, I have an extra paren here. And I'm gonna hit the wrong key, so really mess it up. Oh, no, that's why. Here we go. Okay, right, much better. Um, and so our prediction example, remember our data set that we loaded is not the heights data set, so it goes below zero. Um, it's just this generated R table, right? That because we're using that function the data it spits back is all centered around zero to kind of get used to standard units. Um, so as a result, we can have a prediction that's not, you know, uh, that's not positive, right? Because uh, we don't have anybody who is shorter than zero inches tall. Um, so negative 2.1. And so, but this is using that nearest neighbor's mechanism. So this may not be the same as what you would do with a regression, with a line, right? All right. So, and then, all right, so then we're just going to basically draw the dots. So again, this these dots are the nearest neighbor. And then from that information, we're going to say, okay, hey, can we build a line based on that? Um, and what we're doing here, we're saying, let's just guess the line, okay? And if you notice, right, I don't pass the, the intercept. Any idea why I don't pass the intercept? Yeah, I had a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, in the function, what is the 0.25? Uh, so instead of a window of, like we were doing with the Galton Heights, we were doing a window of like an inch. In this case, we're doing a window of, of half of, like like half of one. What's the space on the graph? It's the, uh, let me show you. Oh. So, so it's saying, these are like these are the neighbors, right? So, but it's only 0.25 and 0.25 rather than what we were saying with the Galton, which was of a, a like uh, double the size, right? All right. So, anybody have any idea why I don't pass the intercept, right? Because I need the slope and the intercept to make a line. Because it's defaulted to zero. So, as a result. I'm going to, it's going to go through zero when I don't pass any. All right. Because with standard units, usually what we expect is the line to go through zero. All right. Um, and then we're just basically kind of doing the same thing, except this time we did it based on a table 
with an R value of zero, okay? And so this is what we end up with. And this is kind of what we were talking about before, is that if you try to build, oh, this is extra slow today. Um, if you try to build our predicted Ys based on this, we're gonna end up with a straight line, okay? Like a uh, horizontal line, sorry. Uh, they were all straight. Um, and then what we can see is when we extrapolate or you know turn that set of neighbors into an actual line, it's still just as bad, right? But we can do the same thing. We just have to be careful that doing the same thing is useful. And then here's kind of the last example, which I'll just kind of blow through quickly. Same idea, except we're using a 0.5 R instead of um, you know the 99 or the zero. Um, and we can start to draw a line. However, in this case, okay, what we did was we guessed a line, okay? And we said, hey, let's say the slope is gonna be one because we think it's gonna be a good one. So we kind of guessed the line in there. And, and sorry, uh, so the 1.5 here is kind of showing you that this is kind of where it crosses the line. So this would be down without the dismiss window, right? It's, it's quite big, right? So our potential for error there is quite a lot. Right, so, so maybe our line isn't that great. So what we can do is we can still use that nearest neighbor mechanism and actually build a new lot or build a series of uh, predictions. And we see that, hey, maybe we were wrong about that 1.5, right? And actually calculate a new, and then maybe take another guess in this case. Um, and we can see that, you know, a 0.5 is actually a better guesstimated Long story short, what we're doing here is kind of using a visual mechanism to say, hey, does the does the line look close? And using instead of looking at uh, the kind of just straight looking at the, the picture, let's try to actually do some predictions and see how our lines line up. And the reason we're talking about this is because we're going to get into like how do we measure the error of these things. All right, so back to these. So one of the ways we do this is we look at what's called the least squares as uh, the least squares measure, right? Um, wait, did I jump the slide? Oh no, so so we talk about least squares here. We're going to talk about the actual least squares usage in a minute. But as you might guess, right, as we've talked about before, to get to the error value, what we want to do is take the actual value of the data we have, right? Subtract the estimate and look for those errors. And obviously, some errors are positive and some are negative but we don't care about that, right? What we care about is how wrong are they, right? We don't care whether they're positively wrong or negatively wrong. So we're generally gonna do some mechanism to even it out to make sure that we're, we're measuring the, you know, like I keep saying, right, distance versus direction. And the way we do, well, kind of the standard practice for doing this, okay? It's not the only way, as I keep kind of iterating on, but the standard practice for doing this is what we do is take the square of the errors to eliminate cancellation. Then we take the mean of those squared errors. I'm going to show an example of this in a second. Then we take the square root to fix the units. So basically because we squared them, right, we made them bigger or maybe smaller, depending. So we're going to take the square root to kind of get it back to where it was. Um, and then we end up with this thing called, sorry, um, we're going to turn on note turn off notifications, we end up with this thing that's referred to as the root mean square error, okay? Uh, and it is often shortened to RMSE. And I can promise you right now from here through the final, we will you will see RMSE without root mean square error. So it's important to remember what that stands for. Um, all right. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> So we get into, so uh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk through these because we talked through them before, but they're just the same functions that we've been using uh, just because I need them. So the first thing we want to do when we're kind of 
getting into this is we want to calculate the slope. Uh, so I showed it in a, a couple of slides ago. Um, anyway, tell me what I want to use for the slope uh, calculation here. So I'm just going to type in return. Might even be already in the notebook. I can't remember. Um, but so what do I need to do to get the, um, oh, I'm actually on the wrong one on my cheat sheet here. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, okay. So I actually need a couple of lines here. So what's the first thing I gotta do when I wanna get to the slope? Actually, there's, there's two choices. There's two halves of the equation. So which part, what do I do first? The R. the R, right? So that's the the same way I did it, but strictly speaking, you can do the other half first, right? Um, correlation, and we already have this as a built-in function that we've used before and talked about before. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to get we're going to call that correlation. We're going to use the table, the x and the y, um, and then what do we do next? Get the standard deviation of x and standard deviation. Of y. Right. So I'm actually going to put these in variables. You could do this faster, right? But it's a little easier to read. Um, T dot column y. And remember, we have. Oh, how about x? And remember, we have um, this built-in uh, function called STD, which is standard deviation. Um, and so we basically do that for both x and y. All right, and so now I have both of those. Now, what is my actual return value? So what is my actual slope? Now I have all the pieces. You need to multiply um, the R times the standard deviation of X and divide by the standard deviation of Y. Oh, backwards? Yeah, but you, yes. Y first and then X. Yeah. So. So it's R times SD divided by XSD. Um, I feel like that has a mistake. Ah. Yeah, I think this needs a brain. Right for order of operations. Um, oh, not there. Here. All right, so that should give us the slope. Uh, and now we do the intercept. And we need a couple of lines here. So who remembers how to do the intercept? The average of y minus the slope times the average of x. All right, so one piece of time. So I'm going to do the average of x, uh, just because that's the way I have it typed in here. Um, x. And then the average of y. And then I'm just going to return it almost directly. So so say the, say the formula again. The inner slope, oh, uh, the average of y minus the slope times the average of x. Minus the slope. Now that we have a slope function that hopefully is right, but I'm scared of those parentheses. X. And so now we should have a slope function and an intercept function that we can use elsewhere, right? And Oh, sorry. So I just have an example here. Um, so basically, I generate another one of those R tables, right, based on a 0.5 correlation. And so I can just run the slope and we get a 0.5, uh, which seems pretty close to right. And off we go. Yeah, I think the prints didn't actually make a difference, but I feel like they should. I don't know why. Um, okay, so going back to the Dalton data. Okay, so this is all the heights of the children and mid-parents and all that jazz. Um, 
And so basically we're just throwing out data to get to just a smaller piece. So we're gonna use the nearest neighbor prediction, which is what we've already done. So I'm not really gonna talk through it too much, but we need it to get further. All right, and that's just a function. So it's not gonna do anything. Um, but, okay. And so then basically we, we've created a function that calculates the predictions based on nearest neighbor. Then we're gonna say, okay, let's just add that set of predictions to the same table. And then we have, um, now we can test our slope and our intercept to find out if we, this is what I wanted to really check, but it looks right. So um, our slope and our intercept. And now what we can do is, well, we can look at a particular example just for future reference, but, oh, I was supposed to delete this because you were supposed to figure this out. Um, but so what I can do is an actual prediction or pull out a particular prediction. Uh, and so say, okay, we have 69.48 and 71.5 here, right? Um, but we actually have a number of them, right? Because we have based on the neighbors, okay? So it's gonna, it, it might come out, like we have a bunch of different ones that are right nearby with different child heights, obviously. But the one we were kind of talking, or was that the prediction we pulled out? No, right, the midparent. So we were particularly interested in in all of these heights, and then but we have some variation in the child heights, which is boring because we've talked about it before. Um, but now we can actually draw our line and do kind of a better prediction, right? So what do we do to get our line here? So we have a slope, we have an intercept, we have x's and y's. So what do I want to do to get um, a predictor? And so in other words, what I want to do is pass in um, I'm just trying to kind of phrase this. Um, so what I want this to be is essentially our, our Y values. Okay, so I want to add a new column over here, right? That looks kind of like this one, except uses the linear mechanism to, to do the prediction. So how do I write that? Any ideas? Yeah. Use like the slope of the line formula. So you'd use a slope times like your X column and then plus your line. Right, so we got the slope earlier and we're gonna say, okay, we take the heights column and mid parent, and then we're gonna use the intercept that we did earlier. Except, and basically we just kind of attach that into the table like we did before. So, so it's getting a lot easier, right? Um, to try to make these predictions because we're starting to have functions we can kind of reuse that are just kind of built in. Um, and so now we have a bunch of predictions and the regression predictions are slightly different than our nearest neighbor predictions, right? Um, which makes me think because there's more variability almost that, um, well, I guess that's hard to say, but uh, I expect those to be to be better because they're using this mechanism instead. Um, so what we can do is show, To, oh no, to say this for me. Um, so now we can show it, right? So now we see our neighbor prediction is in the yellow and then our blue is our regression prediction. So our regression prediction is actually a line, but we're not drawing a line, we're making predictions on the line. So that's why it's still a series of dots, but it's actually using a line. We're just not displaying the line in this particular graph. We're just showing the results of you know, checking on the line for that particular X value. All right. So long story short, basically this is kind of the setup for, okay, now let's, let's check how good this is, right? Um, so you will need to be able to do this. So keep that in mind. You need to be able to take, um, you know, kind of a, an X and then calculate, or an X and a Y really, then calculate the slope, calculate the intercept, and then be able to do a prediction on that line 
based on a particular X. Okay. Yeah. Are we going to have to be able to draw that like straight black line that was the vertical one? Yeah. No, not really. Um, so you can you can learn to. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the stuff that isn't kind of um, like directly related to just using scatter, for example, or whatever other graph, um, those are fine. They're they're not really on the tests or anything. Um, but they're handy, so you might want to figure them out. Um, they, mostly the reason is because they're they're a little confusing. Because if you notice, so where was that black line? Oh boy, too far. Uh, so if you notice um, this draw a vertical line, draw a line, and my scatter, it's like I'm printing three things out in the picture, right? But what's I think kind of confusing in a Jupyter notebook is that some things will trump other things. And so, you know, if you did another scatter here, it might just replace it rather than overlay it or whatever. So, so it's a little like, because Jupyter notebook is trying to render the things for you as it goes along, it does some kind of weird things sometimes. So that's why we don't really like test on it because it doesn't really matter. If you, if you want to make it work, you'll figure it out. It just, you may not be able to figure it out in uh, kind of in a generic way that I can just teach you this is always the right way to do it. So that's why we don't really focus on it. All right, so, oh wait, let's just go to the slides first, sorry. Hold on. Where are my slides? All right, uh, so, so the least squared line, so minimizes the root mean squared error among all lines, right? Because what our goal is, is that we want the closest line or we want the line that has the least amount of errors associated with it. So in a sense, I think of it as the line that's closest to the, almost like the center of the data, okay? But it's not really that, it's really that, when I call X and I get a predicted Y, it's going to have the least amount of error for all the other like lines I could do right in the same area. Does that make sense? Right? It makes sense, right? I mean, like what you want is the best prediction you can get. And the way we measure that is by using this RMSE, but it also helps us find it. Okay. Um, and then just kind of like some terminology. Uh, sorry. This is another thing that's incredibly commonly used. So it tends to get like several different names that all mean the same thing. So it's sometimes referred to as the best fit line, which personally, I think that's the one that makes the most sense, right? Because it's the one that best fits the data, right? Um, and then least squares line, this one in, in some senses is like the most accurate, right? Because it, it calls out exactly what it's doing. Right, it has the least amount of square distance away from the line to errors, right? Um, and then a regression line, which is kind of more generic because we have lots of different kinds of regressions, okay? And regression is kind of semi-synonymous with prediction. So that's why that one will come up, okay? But that's just, if you kind of see any of those, they all mean basically the same thing. Make sense? And then I think we have an example of that. Yeah, so <clears throat> so I'm just going to drop this in here um, because basically the reason the reason this is question marks is because it's how to calculate, excuse me, how to calculate the line. So I didn't want people to be able to pull it out of somewhere else to answer the question. Um, but we did just talk about it. Okay, so we're passing in the slope and the intercept into this function. Okay, and so this is semi ignorable, but basically, we're going to say, for the sake of the picture we're going to draw, we're going to take these sample points. Okay, uh, because remember, we're going we're to draw a scatter plot and then we're going to draw a line over it. And then we want to like call out a couple of points in the scatter. Okay, and so these are those points. Um, there's four of them, right, with an X and a Y. And the reason we're doing that is so that every time I print this, you'll see the same points. And I'll show you why in a minute. 
Um, and then we're going to build a scatter, okay? Except this time we're going to do it off this college data and median income, okay? Uh, like the, uh, it's percentage of people attending college uh, and the median income per particular area. Um, and then uh, this is just to draw the graph, so don't worry about that. Um, and then this is this. So not the same, sorry. Wait. I should just leave these as, as the actual answer. But. Okay, so now we have this little function that essentially is going to draw the problem statements. So this is interesting for all of you because you can kind of see it all working together, but it's not a function you'd ever kind of reuse. It's more just for me to demonstrate uh, the errors. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to build another function that you've seen already that I might even have defined far, further up. Um, but fitted value, so basically it's going to give us back all of our estimates, okay, so that we just have it as one function. And then we're going to go grab that table data and the, or we're just going to talk about the table data real quick. So this is I don't know if I've presented this data or not before, but so by state and then congressional districts within that state, the median income, okay, so $47,000 is how much, you know, the average person in uh, con congressional district one in Alabama is. Um, and then we have percent voting for Clinton in this data set, and we have the percent of people who live there went to college. Okay. So that's what that data is. Um, however, all we're going to look at in this particular case is the median income and the college percentage. Okay. This is mostly just kind of setting it up, right? So as you can see, we think there may be a correlation here, right, between college and median income, right? And what kind of what kind of correlation do we think this is? Yeah, positive, right? So it's going up to the right. Um, so if you go to college, uh, the more people that go to college, the median income seems to rise. All right, but then we can also invert it. Oh, actually, so this is gonna give us, sorry, this is just gonna give us the number. So that's a pretty high correlation, right? Um, which, you know, kind of stands to reason. Uh, like lived experience, anecdotal experience makes me think that that doesn't seem too far off. Um, but what we do then, okay, so let's go after our slope and our intercept based on that data set. So we're using the same functions. Uh, so our slope is, you know, 1,270 and our intercept is 20,802 because this isn't standard units. So, um, yeah. And then... We're just going to predict all of uh, the the values for this scenario. Let me show the picture because I think it's easier. Um, so, based on our original data set, we're going to draw a line that uh, you know, based on a college percentage, we're going to guess what the median income is. Okay, and why is this better than the nearest neighbor? Because we don't have gaps in our data, right? Because we've now kept it in a line that goes on into infinity either way. We can go to college percentages that are negative 27%, which doesn't make any sense at all, but we will get a median income prediction, which will probably also be negative, which won't also make a lot of sense. Actually, at that point, it'll probably still be positive, um, but that's the idea, okay? So now we have a line, we can predict it into infinity either direction, even if it doesn't make any sense. All right, so now we get into the important part, which is the errors. And let me just catch up and make sure I don't say something too stupid. Um, okay, so we have the actuals, right? So that's the median income. So we know what our original data is. So now we want to calculate is the errors, okay? So how do we calculate what are the errors of our prediction versus our actuals of median income? Do you just take the uh, absolute difference of all of the actual data versus the predicted data? Yeah, so because this is labeled error, we're actually not going to take the absolute difference. We're just going to take the difference, but we'll get there. 
uh, if I can find my mouse. Okay, so actual minus predicted, because for some reason in English, we say difference backwards. Um, and so now we have an array of all those errors because I can just do the subtraction from array to array because we know they're all numbers. So we know we can just subtract. Um, and then we're gonna add that to our table. And so now we have you know, our median income, right? And we have our prediction of that income. And then now we have an error rate, right? Or like an amount of error on that prediction from the actuals. Okay, cool. So now what we can look at is what is the average of those errors, okay? And so let's just see what's next. Okay, so the actual of those errors is six or the E minus 13. Okay, so is this, is this a, a small amount of error or a large amount of error? When I take that average, what do you think? And note the E13 or E minus 13. A small amount, a very small amount. Does this look like a small amount? No, right? Because to your point, we're not looking at the absolute values, we're subtracting them from each other. And so our positive errors are offsetting our negative errors. Well, that's no good, right? Because what we want is the error. We don't care that they, they average out to be okay, right? Because that doesn't actually tell us anything about the error. So here is where instead of an absolute value, we're gonna use our, our root mean square error mechanism, okay? And so, to do that, um, yeah, all right, so we just take NP mean, but before we uh, do the average, we're actually going to uh, uh, square the errors. So we're just going to square it to two, right? And then to bring it back to the same, to the kind of the original units, we're going to square root, oh wait, we're going to square root the result. Okay, that looks a lot more reasonable, right? Because now we've accounted for the fact that that difference uh, is there. Um, and if you wanna get into uh, higher level stats, like in the mathematics side, uh, there's a lot more, there's reasons why we don't just take the absolute value of this subtraction. Okay, but I'm, we're not gonna get into it today. All right, so now we can, have a broken button. Uh, did I forget to actually run that? Yeah. Let me just see. <laughs> All right, so I'm pretty confident I just have a typo in here, so I'm just gonna uh, replace it with my kind of known good one um, and hope that that will work. Okay, and it did. Um, all right, and so remember those four points we called out? That's them, right? And so the little red lines there are the distance from our prediction um, and, you know, and drawn as a red line away from the line. So, so looks pretty good, right? I mean, they're, they're not that far away, but what we care about is actually getting to a real number or, you know, so that we can make a, a more kind of intelligent error uh, estimation. Um, but what we can also do is now we can also, and this, and the reason we're talking about this is we have um, some functionality that we can use where we can just kind of make guesses about what the line should be, right? Because what we've done so far is we have to know what the data is, right? So to be able to calculate the slope and the intercept, 
But now we also have a mechanism for recognizing whether or not we have a good line. Is this making sense? So if we have an RMSE and it's 10, and we have another line with an RMSE of two, then we know that that slope and intercept are better than the original one that we have. So if we don't have any data at all, right, could we make a line for prediction? What do y'all think? I mean, I'm kind of leading the, the horse here, but if I if I have a mechanism for for figuring out whether a good line is a, whether a line for prediction is good or bad, I don't actually need the data. I can just try them all, right? So this is what I'm kind of showing here, and we're going to talk more about basically that that optimization technique uh, next time. Uh, but I didn't think we'd have time to get into it today. Um, so if you notice, we're just calling that exact same function, but we're kind of using just arbitrary numbers where we, that we think will end up with the right kind of line. Okay. Based. So this is actually based on the data, but we could just base it on what the picture is, right? We could just kind of guess where it should be. Or actually, I guess another way of putting it is we don't have enough data to do a good prediction. We can start guessing around it, right? Because we have to have something to get an idea that there's a correlation at all. But if we don't have enough, what we can do is say, hey, let's start moving it around until we make sure that we get the best RMSE that we possibly can. And if you, oh boy, and if you think about what we've been doing, right, it's like we kind of have all these different techniques for kind of taking a data set that we have and improving what we can get out of it, right? So if we can do that, and then we can combine that with this technique where we're saying, okay, so you've improved the data. So you've like kind of increased it somehow. Maybe you bootstrapped it, right? Or you resampled it or whatever. You've kind of improved that quality of that data. Well, now I can feed that into these mechanisms and say, hey, I can make a prediction algorithm that will do a good prediction, but then I can check and make sure that it's doing the best prediction, but I can further tune it by getting it closer and closer. You know, if I had to do it manually, right, I could type in 1501, right? Instead of, you know, like this one, I can type in 1501 and see if my RMSC goes down, right? I should probably be printing the RMSC in this and that'd be, make it make a little more sense. Um, but as you can see, when I type in that value, right, I get a very bad prediction. It makes sense, but I can tell that very easily from that RMSC. So making sense so far? So basically what we're trying to do is we're saying, we want to minimize the amount of work we have to do of any kind, right? We want to lower the amount of people we have to interview. We want to lower the amount of computation we have to do by using shuffling or, or bootstrapping or whatever. But the tricks we do to kind of improve that initial, hopefully the smallest data set we can get. Then next we're going to say, hey, let's try doing some guesswork around it to make sure that we get the best Answer right. Go ahead. Can you scroll to the function that you calculate this when you get the picture? Oh, uh, yeah. Or um, I can drop it into the live notebook if you remind me, because um, it's it's a lot of text. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you want to do it quickly, I just I can't remember how much we have left. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so, oh, that's why, because uh, I started talking about it before I was necessarily supposed to yet, um, but let's talk about how we calculate it. So, come on, really? Oh. And, Okay, so what I'm doing here, right, is so I'm just kind of doing what we were doing before, which is I'm taking those predictions, right, based on the X and the Y and making a line out of it. And then I'm saying, okay, let me go get those predictions and get the errors out of it, then squaring it so that now I have an MSE, okay, so the mean square error. And then I'm going to print the RMSE, okay, except I'm going to round it to make it a little bit more readable. 
Um, and so for those same examples I had above, this is what I was saying is I, I thought we had it printed later, but I had forgotten I had it kind of in two blocks. So the root mean square error here is 30,000, um, which seems like a lot. Negative 1,000 as our uh, slope seems wildly inappropriate, right? Like it's it doesn't fit the data at all. But our 1,500 and 20,000, that starts looking pretty good, right? So it's about 11,000 K off, which when you're talking about the amount of money we're talking about, that's still pretty bad, okay? But it's way better than our other one. So we're getting closer, right? Um, and then this is kind of the real one. Um, so, but based on the data, because in this particular case, we have a good data set. So we can get quite a bit better, right? I mean, it's like $2,000 better, um, which, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer. Um, and like I said, we don't know that that's necessarily the optimal choice, which is what we'll do next lecture, but we do know that that's pretty good, right? We have a pretty good idea that it's in the, it's in the right vein, you know, we're getting a pretty good result. And don't forget, because we're using regular units, we need to think about that number in terms of like salaries, not in terms of like standard units and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so for clarification, that isolates the best range in which the data best represents the line. The line best represents the data. Okay. Yes. So it's measuring how poorly the line represents the data, right? All right. Now I really will go back to the slides. And let's see how we do. Um, okay. So kind of talking about lingo again. Okay. Um, that difference there we refer to as residual. Okay. Um, and that's just kind of the, the real term for it. Um, when I was in elementary school, I remember being taught it as the remainder. Okay. Uh, but the kind of real term is residual. Uh, and so we have a residual that corresponds to each point, right? Because it's, it's how wrong that one result is. Um, and then kind of thinking about a residual in three ways, right? So it's the observed Y minus the regression estimate of Y. That's kind of one way to think about the residual or the observed Y minus the height of the regression line at X. These are all saying the same thing, just kind of in different ways. Um, and then the vertical distance between the point and the best line. So this might be really obvious if you think about it, it's kind of different ways of phrasing the same concept because what all we're really doing is saying, I got a line, how far is the real element from it, right? Or how far, uh, yeah, is the is the real element from it for that particular X value, okay? All right, so next question is, has anybody ever heard of a dugong? What's a dugong? Anybody know? Yeah, so it's actually a, a variant of a manatee. Um, and so I can remember, I think manatees are saltwater and dugongs are freshwater, or maybe it's reverse. I, I can't remember which one it is, um, but they're relatively endangered. Um, you know, I don't know where exactly they are on the scale, but they're not doing terribly well. They live in a very small part of the world. Um, and uh, so, but we have some data about dugongs. And I think they look hilariously funny, much like manatees. Um, so manatees, at least when I used to live in Florida, were referred to as the cow of the ocean or the cow of the water. Um, so if we look at our residuals, um, this is the same as above. I just want to make sure that the function has the same stuff. Yeah. OK, so this is kind of the same as above. Um, and so, oops. So what we're going to do is we're going to now define a function that we're going to call residuals to start making it um, kind of in the right lingo. But in fact, the activity is essentially the same. So here, <coughs> we're going to say t dot column, oops, column y minus our predictions, right? 
Okay, so exactly the same thing we were doing before. We're just going to call it residuals. So we start using the right language. Um, and now uh, we're going to throw that onto a table. So now we have our income, we have a college percentage, we have our linear prediction, we have a fitted value, and we have the residual. And so remember, a fitted value is, is our model value, right? Um, and, you know, kind of drawing this picture. I don't know why it's, it should have been clear. Um, so this is where the residuals come in. And if you remember from last Tuesday's uh, lecture, here's our kind of original scatter plot. This is our data, right? With our line through it and our uh, fitted values through it or whatever. But these are our residuals. Does anybody notice anything? Well, this isn't a brilliant example. Let me see. Yeah, uh, this one gets better. Um, so I'll, I'll hold that question uh, for a second. Um, but so let me just make sure, I think that's the same function. Um, so in this one, instead of putting it together, which I think kind of skews how they look, we're putting it as two separate tables, okay? So this is our original data with our line cut through it, um, as well as our uh, predictions. And then here is our residuals. What do we notice about those residuals? And if you remember from that, like not this past Tuesday, Tuesday before, I mentioned, what do we want that to look like? Remember, you had to send me an email that you were in attendance. And so if you sent me at all late and you can't answer this question, because I did talk about it, I feel like maybe, I don't know. Anyone? Come on. You don't want any pattern. Yeah, you don't want any pattern. That's kind of one way to put it. I think it is like you want it to look like a big blob, right? You want it to be, the, you want the opposite of what you want a correlation, right? So, you know, a correlation of zero, you kind of want it to look like that. Because does anybody have any theories as to why we want it to look like that? That would mean that there's like no consistent error or the same error happening over the course. Right. So that the error is kind of non-uniform, right? And we also want the, this blob to be as small as possible, right? So we want error to be kind of you know opposite each other, right? But we also want the whole thing to be as small as possible because obviously this is our range of error, right? So the, the smaller it is, the smaller the range, the better, right? So those are the two things you want to kind of account for is you want to have as much, um, you know, you want to be as much positive wrong as you are negative wrong, you know, or as often on the whole data set. Does that make sense? Because if there's uniformity in the error, that means you probably have the best line you can get. Even if that error is still wide, what you don't want is to always be under, you know, under guessing on median income, right? You always want to be like even. You want to, you know, sometimes be over guessing and sometimes under guessing. You don't want to be always under guessing or always over guessing. Well, we are almost out of time. All right. And so kind of going back to the Galton Heights, we can start to look at the residuals for our fitted calcs here and see that actually looks pretty good, right? Um, you know, we're plus or minus. Um, and, but again, that unif there, or yeah, the uniformity of, of not anything interesting, right? It's just, it's consistent uh, is a good thing. Um, and so, we were going to talk about the dugongs, but I think we are going to be out of time. So I won't get into it too much, but uh, I will I'll tease it a little bit. But as you can see, the dugongs is what we're going to look at is the length of the dugong. And I think this is in, uh, actually, it's probably in meters because um, they're, they're big. Um, and then the age. So as you might imagine, or what I would expect, right, as they get older, they're going to get bigger, right? So and we'll talk. We'll either talk about dugong some more next time, or we'll talk about a different example. Talking about what people do that. Any questions?